Hey, y'all, make sure you stay tuned to the end of this episode as there's a special treat for you. Okay, enjoy. Hello, I'm John Rossi, a touring drummer with a love of all things animal. When I'm on the road, I visit as many zoos, aquariums... Hey, wait a minute, what's going on? Hey, what's going on there? Hello? 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 We interrupt your regularly scheduled program to bring you Rossafari Zoo News. News you can use from the world of zoos and conservation. Every week, we bring you breaking news and analysis from around the globe, featuring the animals you love and the people who care for them. And here's your anchorman, John Rossi. Hello, 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 and welcome to yet another exciting episode of Rossafari Zoo News, coming to you this time from a closet in Phoenix, Arizona. Yep, I'm in a closet, y'all. One of the most interesting things about doing this podcast... Okay, that's a lie. There are many interesting things about doing this podcast, and what I'm about to say doesn't really crack the top. But uh, a thing that is interesting about doing this podcast is the fact that as I go from city to city, town to town, I have to figure out how to set up and record. Uh, I have to do it at zoos and aquariums and all kinds of, you know, interesting places. We've recorded episodes on rain barrels outside of exhibits. We've recorded episodes, uh, you know, on a tour bus. Y'all know about that. And, um, Yeah, sometimes, you know, we have really nice housing. Sometimes I'm at a facility and we really have to wing it. Uh, And this time here in Phoenix with Great Balls of Fire, the show that I'm doing at Arizona Broadway Theater, um, we have this amazing house that the entire band is living in. It's incredible. There are five of us. There are six bedrooms, including a kid's room with a castle that I will not confirm whether or not we have played with those toys already. Um, But it's, it's this amazing house. But there isn't really a desk. There's there's one desk in the entire place, and uh, it's in a very loud public area. So um, when we were divvying up the rooms, I chose uh, – okay, so first, even before I say that, I have to explain to you that we are in – like a family house that they rent out. It's kind of like an Airbnb. It's a different company, but you get the idea. And um, I took the little girl's room uh, in part to match my personality and um, in part because there was a dresser in the closet that I thought was the right height to set up my recording gear on if I wanted to stand and record a podcast. Now, I basically never stand and record a podcast, but there was literally nowhere to set up and have chairs and do what I do without other people being present and me having to say like, hey, can you stay out of the kitchen for an hour while I record? And that that wasn't going to happen. So I am standing in the closet of a little girl's room right now. Right outside the door is the bed that I'm sleeping in on this contract, which is uh, super comfortable, but is totally one of those beds that has, you know, the bed and then the posts going up and then all kinds of frilly little stuff hanging down from like a frame above it. And um, sitting next to me in my uh, recording studio slash closet is like a little baby bed with a little baby veil on it. And more fake flowers that had been decorating the room and are now shoved in here because I didn't want a bunch of fake flowers um, than I have ever seen in one place before. It's 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 hilarious. It's astonishing. And this is truly one of the more entertaining things about doing this gig. It really is. I uh, I record and then I go back and I listen to an episode and I'm like, wow, these three sound exactly the same. And one of them was in a hotel room in Los Angeles. One of them was at a zoo in some weird random room that they found for me. I remember my Sarah Glass episode was recorded in the breastfeeding room at Zoo Knoxville because it was relatively quiet and it worked. And uh, and now I'm, I'm coming to you live on tape from a... Uh, a little girl's bedroom closet with flowers. So uh, never a dull moment. But despite all that, I am here, I'm recording, and we're good to go. Um, I'm having a great time in Phoenix. We opened the show two nights ago, and uh, opening was incredible. It was a great audience, great group of people here. 
Um, I have found some really cool facilities in the area that I have reached out to. Well, we'll see. I haven't, I haven't, I literally did that last night. Now I'm recording this today. I have been a little lazy, but uh, hopefully we get some cool content from this area because there are some really, really unique facilities here. So, uh, I'm excited to be here and spend some time playing some drums and doing animal stuff. And, uh, you know, it's kind of what I always do, but um, haven't spent a lot of time in Phoenix. I've only toured through a couple times and only had a few days here. So I'm excited to really dig in and check it out over the next couple of weeks. But uh, enough about me. Here's an ad. Today's episode is brought to you by Daydreamers Studios. Do you have stories and expertise to share with the world? Have you ever thought about starting your own podcasts? There's no better time to start than now with the help of a trusted production partner. Daydreamer Studios is a full-service production company that takes all the stress off your plate. You can focus on creating engaging content while they focus on recording, editing, audio engineering, hosting, and publishing on 22 platforms. Log into the advanced remote system with one click and the Daydreamer team will be on the other end ready for you to record everything you have to say. Owned and operated by Daydreamer Network, Daydreamer Studios continues on the company's mission to empower storytellers of all kinds by making podcasting accessible to all. For more information and current promotions, visit daydreamernetwork.com slash studios. All right, let's get to it. Well, it's one for the pandas, two for the bears, three for the monkeys. Now you should care, now won't you listen to Zoot News? Oh, you could do anything, but why not listen to Zoot News? Well, it's a Zoot, 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 Zoot. Okay, so we start off today in Boston at Franklin Park Zoo. And y'all, this is a doozy of a story. Matthew Abraham, a 24-year-old Worcester, Massachusetts resident, broke into the zoo by climbing over a fence and then decided to go visit the tiger there. And to clarify, I don't mean the way that we all go and visit the tiger by standing at the exhibit and looking in. I mean he decided to go hang out with the tiger. Yeah, that's right. There's another person who is trying to go hang out with a tiger like what recently happened at Naples. However, this story has a better ending as he only made it over a couple of the fences before security saw him, tackled him, and held him until the police could arrive and arrest him, charging him with disorderly conduct and trespassing. When asked about his actions, Abraham said that a lady let him into the zoo, which, um, since he scaled a fence to get in, was, you know, probably not <clears throat> entirely accurate. And uh, then he said, and I quote, After I was let in, I saw the caretaker by the tiger, and I'm interested in the psychology of predatory animals such as tigers and lions. I thought that since there was a fence, I wasn't encroaching on his territory, and I thought I would be okay. I just wanted to get close to it. All right, we'll be back after this quick break. Check out the new nature podcast that everyone is talking about, Birds of a Feather Talk Together. If you like Radiolab or Planet Earth, you'll love Birds of a Feather Talk Together. Escape from the daily grind into the world of birds. Two experts and two amateurs talk about a different species every week. Recently, we talked about the osprey, burrowing owls, roadrunners, pigeons, giant hummingbirds, house wrens, sandhill cranes, and so many more. We have a lot of fun every week. Learn more about the incredible birds around you and some that you didn't know existed. Birds of a feather talk together. You're going to like these birds. I guarantee it. Along with the police showing up, EMS also showed up and evaluated Abraham and determined he was mentally competent. Which is kind of amazing to me because I would think that a test for mental competence would include not trying to get into an enclosure with a tiger. But hey, what do I know? I'm not a psychologist. I'm a drummer. Anyway, the good news about all of this is that it happened as the zoo was open and security was there and... The tiger, you know, had no issues. There were there. This wasn't another Naples thing. And um, 
the tiger is alive and well, though apparently it was not super happy with its intruder and did growl repeatedly at him, and somehow he still didn't realize, hey, maybe I shouldn't be here. Um, dude, if you're interested in the psychology of predators, them growling at you, I, I would think that your st psychology study could tell you what that means. That's, that's, that's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. Um, great job to everyone at Franklin Park Zoo for handling the situation so well, keeping the animal safe, keeping the human safe, uh, because otherwise the animal wouldn't have been safe. Otherwise, I kind of don't care I, if you're getting into an exhibit with a tie. Anyway, 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 drinking too much coffee, ranting too much about idiots at zoos. But this story has an interesting postscript to me, which is that recently, stay with me on this one. I got a new pair of glasses. They're these Warby Parker frames. They look really a lot like my old ones, but I really like them. Like, I feel good in them. I like them. People seem to like them. I have gotten compliments on them. And this dude has the same glasses that I now have. And y'all, I'm having a slight existential crisis about that. So um, really, I think at the end of the day, it wasn't the tiger and it wasn't him, but I'm the loser in this story. On a less stupid and actually really cool note, um, the AZA is now partnering with Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom in order to make new episodes of that show, hopefully using these to showcase what the AZA accredited institutions are doing for animals and animal conservation. This is really exciting. This is a thing that I keep talking about, how, you know, zoos need to parrot the stuff that they are doing that is awesome and teaming up with the show that is beloved and, you know, also really respected and trusted is a great way to do that. I'm excited to hear about this. And also, while I'm telling you this, do I have any contacts that listen to this who might know people at the AZA? Because I would sure love to, you know, have Rasafari be a part of their official push to spread the word about the good things being done by amazing institutions like AZA accredited zoos. The Denver Zoo recently announced that they have gotten a pair of animals in that will be on exhibit soon. And, you know, I know y'all love your really exotic animals. So wait until I tell you about the Denver Zoo's latest residents, two new raccoons. Okay, okay, stay with me here. So the Denver Zoo actually has an exhibit called Harmony Hill, which is an entire area dedicated to teaching people how to live in harmony with wildlife. And that doesn't just include cool exotic animals, but it includes the stuff that you find in your own backyard. A lot of people think raccoons are problematic animals and, you know, they can be. Coexistence is always hard between human and non-human animals, but... um. Raccoons are also kind of awesome. And so when Pecan and Cashew, these, these two adorable little raccoons, were rescued by Sunflower Ranch and Rescue, and it was decided that they could not be re-released into the wild, the Denver Zoo decided to take them in and be their forever home. Not only are they cool and cute and going to serve an incredibly important message to the people who, who see them and learn that raccoons can be awesome and you can coexist with them, but they're also going to be really interesting to look at because they are leucistic raccoons, meaning that they have partial pigment loss. So not full albinism, they're not albino, but, but close. In this case, it looks like they are basically white raccoons, but without the red eyes of albinism. I know it's getting into anthropomorphism a little bit, but I always love to think about when an animal is rescued from a situation. In this case, they were living in the walls of a human house that, you know, the humans didn't want them there. And I have to imagine that they're scared and they don't know what's going on and they're trapped and, and whatever. And they don't realize that they're about to be transported to the best life that you can have as an animal. I mean, it's it's such a cool story. It's it's. Annie without the absolutely horrible music. I just, I love it. Ugh, God, I hate the music in Annie. But anyway, moving on from that topic, um, you know, COVID-19 has not been great for zoos for a lot of reasons. And uh, it's weird, though, because it also has been. Stay with me. So obviously animals, you know, getting sick with COVID, all that stuff, having to pay for the vaccine for their animals. Not, not great. Not great. The fact that a lot of facilities were closed for months and months and months. Super not great. However, 
Recent studies have shown that people have such a thirst to get out and to experience more now that since zoos reopened, many of them have set all-time attendance records. People are coming out in droves, especially to zoos, which are open air and thus probably safer from what we understand of the virus. So um, that's been really cool. It still hasn't made up all of the lost income, but it's definitely helping the situation. Because of this, more zoos than ever are turning to alternative revenue streams, figuring out how they can make extra money at their facility. And one big thing that is starting to become more popular is weddings at zoos or special experiences other than weddings, such as overnight experiences, glamping, real camping, whatever. A lot of zoos are getting into this and it's becoming a really big thing right now. One great example of this is happening in Chittenago, New York, where the owner of the Wild Animal Park is planning a $10 million expansion that's going to include a wedding venue, a high-end campground, and also some new animal encounter experiences that will be targeted towards the people who stay for camping or, you know, have a wedding there. While this is just one example and a rather extreme one at 10 million, you're going to start seeing more and more of this happening in zoos. As I've been talking to people, you know, behind the scenes and off the record at different zoos, I keep hearing that they are looking for new ideas and new ways to expand. And I've got to tell you, the places that do a lot of this are incredibly successful. I mean, look at the San Diego Zoo and Safari Park. They have so many amazing behind the scenes experiences. You can sleep in these awesome tents. It's called the Roar and Snore Safari at the uh, Safari Park. Some of the tents are literally right by the elephants. Others, you'll have giraffes and rhinos wandering near you. I mean, obviously, you're not, you know, in with them, but you get real close. It's it's really cool. And and I think you're going to see more and more zoos and, and um, aquariums taking advantage of this kind of thing and trying to make up that revenue that they lost uh, early in the pandemic and hopefully build a stronger revenue base moving forward. And frankly, along with their own financial solvency, an important thing about, you know, opportunities and getting money to zoos is that they are conservation organizations and they help out with a lot of species and a lot of cool things and things that, you know, we don't always know about, like I mentioned earlier on this episode and, oh, every episode ever. And that includes the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance being a part of the recovery program for the Stevens Kangaroo Rat. The Stevens Kangaroo Rat was officially classified as endangered in 1988. And since then, the Carlsbad Fish and Wildlife Service, along with the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance and all kinds of other conservation orgs and stuff like that, came together to try to save the species. And this week, it was officially announced that the Stevens kangaroo rat is being reclassified from endangered to threatened. Yay! So, while the species still needs help and is not yet at a fully sustainable population in the wild, it is awesome to see that, yet again, a zoo, working as a conservation organization, helped a species that a lot of you are probably thinking, I don't even know what that looks like. I need to Google it. Is it a kangaroo? Is it a rat? Is it just some animal that looks like my friend named Stephen? I don't really know. Um, but they've, they've helped, and they've made a huge impact yet again in saving an incredibly important species to the local biome. These are always the stories that warm my heart the most, you know, along with the other ones that warm my heart. And as that story was both zoo news and conservation news, I think I'm going to use it as a transition to... Conservation! Conservation! News time! Oh yeah! So we start our conservation news segment with a concerning story out of Namibia. The government of Namibia recently announced that 57 elephants have been successfully sold to three bidders. Fifteen of the elephants are expected to stay in Namibia, while the other 42 will be exported around the globe. But, and here's where this gets really creepy, we don't know who the buyers were, and we don't know where the elephants are supposed to go. 
Now, with all the elephant conservation stuff going on in the world, you might be confused as to how this is happening. Well, the government of Namibia decided that there is an elephant overpopulation in the country and so decided to sell off some of these elephants. Experts and conservationists say there is absolutely not an overpopulation problem and that the government just wants to profit off of one of their natural resources, if you will. I think that both are true. The research that I have done has led me to conclude that there isn't an overpopulation problem with elephants in Namibia. However, there has been an increase in elephant-human conflict recently. But as we all know, there are solutions to that other than selling off elephants. So the government is currently in the process of collecting these elephants from the wild and um, – putting them onto a farm where so far 22 of the elephants have been captured and put there. And uh, some of the ones that have been captured have already given birth because they were pregnant. This is this is not good, friends. This is this is kind of gross. The government is claiming that they captured entire herds of elephants so as to not affect the social structure of the herds and and cause additional stress to the animals. But, you know, there's no way to actually verify that fact. Along with the problems that this causes for elephants and elephant conservation, there's also a serious question of whether the government can even legally do this as the International Wildlife Treaty that regulates the export of wild African elephants, known as CITES, C-I-T-E-S, was amended in 2019 to bar elephants in Botswana, Zimbabwe, South Africa, and Namibia from being exported to any country where the animals don't or haven't lived in the wild unless there is a proven conservation benefit. And uh, like I said, the government is not even saying where these elephants are going, much less how there could be a conservation benefit for the move. Now, I don't want to do any sensationalism, and I am 90% sure that this is not happening. But Dan Ash, the president and CEO of the AZA, stated that the AZA is unaware of any involvement by its members in the Namibian elephant auction. But he added that members are under no obligation to inform the AZA about potential animal imports, which is something that I find concerning as heck. And the fact that they actually felt the need to to say that and explain that means that even the AZA doesn't know if their own member facilities are importing some of these elephants against that treaty and and really against what most of the AZA seems to stand for. Um, I, I, again, I doubt that is happening. But the fact that that statement is out there really like raised, you know, some goosebumps on, on the alarms here. So uh, I just wanted to share that with all of you. Y'all know I love and support the AZA overall, but uh, whew, that, that statement stood out to me a little bit. Anyway, unfortunately, there's not much that we can do about this right now, but I think it's important that we all be vigilant and keep our eyes open and uh, track what Namibia says about this and where the elephants end up going. Apparently, the agreement in the auction is that they won't say where they're going until all of them have been collected and transported, but we need to follow that trail and not just let this fall off the radar. While we're talking about some unfortunate conservation news, y'all know that Madagascar is home to a ton of species that only live in the wild on Madagascar, including lemurs of all types and, and all kinds of other cool stuff. Um, Madagascar has recently had not one, but two major cyclones rip across the land doing a ton of damage right now. There's absolutely no way for us to know how much damage is done or what effect this will have on the wildlife populations there or on conservation efforts moving forward. But I wanted to make you all aware of the fact that Madagascar, which already kind of needs a lot of help, is going to need a lot more help. And this is a news story that outside of the conservation world is not going to get a ton of news coverage. Twisters in Madagascar. People don't really care, unfortunately. So if you happen to see any way that you can help the Malagasy people, the Malagasy conservation organizations out there, or of course the animals of Madagascar in general, take that opportunity now because boy howdy, they need it. And as we stick with our bad news portion of conservation news, sorry to hit you with so much heavy right at the beginning of the section, y'all, the last known Irrawaddy dolphin, which lived on a stretch of the Mekong River near Cambodia's border with Laos, 
has died this week after it was snagged in a fishing net. I realized that with one known member, the species was functionally extinct and had been for a while. But uh, it's really hard for me to even say that a species has gone extinct right now because of humans and human activity. And the fact that the last remaining one of these animals got caught up in a fishing net, despite the fact that we have all seen so much work and and put so much effort and money into avoiding that kind of thing is just devastating to me. I hate this story so freaking much. But rather than be down about it, I'm just going to use this as a reminder that yet again, we need to keep digging in and doing more work and and doing better work and and getting the conservation message out to more people and sharing to more people how important saving animals is. This was completely avoidable. In fact, it wasn't until the fishing industry mobilized in the area where these dolphins lived that they became endangered and then their population just plummeted. Humans cause so much damage to the other animal species on this planet and uh, I'm just devastated to see another one leave because of that. Okay, so we need to we need to spin this around. So let's go for some good conservation news, please. I, it's not even for y'all at this point. It's for me as well. Um, and and this is this is really exciting news. So y'all know that the northern white rhino is functionally extinct, incredibly in trouble. There are two left. They are both females. They are mother and daughter, and neither of them can breed because of all the things I just said. However, we've talked about this on the pod before. If you don't know, there's an amazing conservation effort underway where the goal is to take frozen sperm from northern white rhinos and implant it into eggs of those two rhinos and then have southern white rhinos serve as surrogates and and have northern white rhino babies. In fact, when I was in Escondido recently at the San Diego Zoo Safari Park, I actually got to meet two of the rhinos who are going to serve as the the surrogate mothers. And uh, wow, it was it was astonishing. It was so cool. It was also kind of amazing to just see this this small little, you know, rhino center. It was a small building and they, they have their room and everything. Everything was great, but it was, you know, you could go there and think that you were just looking at any rhino at any zoo or safari park. But uh there they were, the, the potential future of an entire species. It was really something else to see. Um, but that's not the news. Uh, that's just me being excited about having met those cool, cool animals. The exciting news is that there are two new pure northern white rhino embryos in existence, bringing the total number to 14. Fatu, the younger of the two rhinos out in the wild at Olpegida, um gave two more eggs and they weren't entirely sure that there were going to be any more eggs. So this is a huge deal. All right, we'll be back after this quick break. Hi, this is Kathy Hill from the Indian River Lagoon National Estuary Program. We're all about restoration, projects, and progress this season on One Lagoon, One Voice. Learn about the great strides the lagoon community is taking to restore and protect the Indian River Lagoon. Each week, we dive deep into discussions with scientists, resource managers, and nonprofit leaders to explore lagoon issues and solutions. From oyster reefs to clam restoration, algae blooms to muck, you'll learn all about the projects we're tackling to bring the Indian River Lagoon back to health. Click the link in the show notes to follow One Lagoon, One Voice, learn about the IRL Council, and explore our unique lagoon. This means that there are now 11 embryos from Fatu and Sunni, another male who lived on Olpegeta until his death in 2014, and three from Fatu and Anaglifu. Embryos developed from different unrelated males provide diversity to the gene pool and help to create a viable population. These embryos are currently stored in liquid nitrogen, and those frozen little blobs represent the entire future, well, entire potential future of a species. It's pretty amazing. 
I also find just it's such a fascinating thing, the world of conservation, when you think about it. We've got scientists who are Jurassic parking up some new rhinoceros for us from a species that is functionally extinct. And then we've got another species going extinct because we can't figure out how to fish without killing endangered dolphins like this is it's so fascinating because the world we're all in such different places and i don't just mean geographically but i mean in terms of economics and understanding and education and uh caring about this stuff you know empathy and and also beyond that just you know as we sit most of us who listen to this are in the united states or parts of europe that are you know doing pretty darn well and it's it's hard to to think about the willingness to kill an endangered animal but also if your family is starving and that's your only source of income uh, it it just it all gets so complicated. And I'm just I'm fascinated by these two stories and the fact that we have this amazing science and stuff that, you know, 20 years ago, sci fi writers were coming up with. And it was revolutionary. And we all laughed that we couldn't do it uh, going on to save the northern white rhino. And then we also just have the reality of people wiping out species because we still haven't quite figured out how to make nets not do that yet or how to make those people care. And uh, it, it's it's really fascinating to think about. OK, I'm hopping off my soapbox now. Well, I mean, actually, this podcast literally is my soapbox, so I, I guess I'm not. But I will let us go to. In other Okay, it's time to anthropomorphize again, but we're going to do it adorably. So, in California recently, a man named Scott Thompson fell off his boat into the rather cold Santa Barbara Channel whilst only wearing a t-shirt and shorts. Not a great recipe for, you know, staying alive. Also, the boat that he was on still had the engine running, so it went away from him. His boat left him. He was the only one on the boat, and it abandoned him. <laughs> wow. I said I was going to anthropomorphize and I didn't actually mean that I was going to do that about a boat uh, since that's not an animal. But hey, you know, I just did whatever. Anyway, the point is that Scott was in the water and definitely thought that he was going to freeze and drown when all of a sudden a little seal showed up and started bobbing around and checking him out. And Thompson says that at the point he felt like giving up. He really felt like he was burnt out and going to freeze and drown. And um, when the seal showed up, it gave him a boost. And then he started talking to it. And he felt like, well, if this creature is alive, then so can I. And so he started swimming as hard as he could. The seal stayed by Thompson's side for the entire time of this ordeal, which ended up being over five hours of swimming, and even nudged him repeatedly, which Thompson took to mean the seal was saying, don't give up. And he didn't. After those five hours, he came upon an oil rigger whose crew pulled him from the water, treated him for hypothermia, and he is alive and well today, giving full credit to the seal that saved his life. A group of hunters in Alabama recently shot an eight-point buck when they realized that something was off. The deer had a full eight-point rack of solid antlers, but no male reproductive parts. In fact, it had female reproductive parts, but a full head of solid antlers. Suffice it to say, the hunters were confused. It turns out that the deer is what is known as a pseudo-hermaphrodite, something that has been seen before, kind of, in Alabama, but this is the first ever one that had a true, full, hardened rack of antlers on its head. Pseudo-hermaphroditic deer will have testes inside the body cavity, which is how they're able to have antlers form, but will also have external female organs, which will generally be underdeveloped and not able to, you know, they won't be able to reproduce or anything. 
Interestingly, the deer in question had actually been following a doe and acting like a normal male interested in mating, sniffing urine, getting excited, all that kind of stuff. So we don't fully understand what pseudo-hermaphrodism in deer can do to the deer, but it, it seems to have some some interesting uh, interesting side effects for sure. Um, it's cool to know that this is out there and and to to have seen such a strong example of it for the first time ever. And last but not least in uh, our other news category, I have an extra what the F Pennsylvania story for y'all. So I grew up in Cumberland County in central Pennsylvania and um, state trooper Megan Ammerman recently tweeted this. Cumberland County 81, one of the highways there, is still shut down for cows on the roadway. One cow remains on the loose at this time. Get it together, Pennsylvania. Animal, animal, animal holidays. Animal, animal, animal holidays. All right. So reminder, February is Adopt a Rescue Rabbit Month, International Hoof Care Month, Fishing Cat February, and National Bird Feeding Month. February 28th to March 4th is National Invasive Species Week. So let's go out there and celebrate all our favorites like red-eared sliders and lionfish. And then the only day that we have this week is February 27th, which is International Polar Bear Day. And those are your animal holidays for the week. So there you have it, folks. Another week of zoo news is in the bag. I'd like to say thanks to Laura Shank, my Red Panda level patron, and also to the people who sent me stories for this episode. Anya Keen, Colleen Lenahan, Kim Cooley, Liz Dunleavy, Crystal Chapman, and Kristen Khalil. Thank you so much. Y'all rock. And hey, if you see a zoo conservation or other animal story that you think would fit Zoo News, why don't you pass that along to me? You can email me, rossafaripod at gmail.com, or DM me or tag me on social media. I'm at rossafari everywhere except for TikTok, where I'm at rossafaripod. And, uh, you know, while you're there, give it a follow to all of those places. It's a good idea. Highly recommend it. Oh, and also make sure that you are back here in your podcast feed on Tuesday for a new episode coming to you from the Oklahoma Aquarium. It's one you're not going to want to miss. Now, before we go, I have a little treat for y'all uh, for being patient and making it to the end of the episode. I, you know, I record this thing and it's the Zoo News stuff when it's not the interview episodes. It's just me talking into a microphone again, sometimes in a little girl's closet, which out of context sounds creepy. But so I wanted to share with you um, an outtake from today, just because this is what my entire recording session sounds like. And uh, I think it's hilarious. So uh, here you go. It turns out that the deer in question was what is known as a pseudo ha <laughs> Words are hard. Literally stuff like that. Endlessly. I, um, <laughs> I think if I ever released a full unedited version of Zoo News, I would lose all of you as listeners, at least for that episode. But um, before you gave up, you would laugh a lot because I talk to myself, I yell at myself, I sing stupid things like words are hard and stuff like that endlessly. Uh, yeah, so I just thought I would share that with you because I thought you might enjoy it. Okay, here come those Steiderk you swen. The Rossafari Podcast is produced, hosted, and engineered by John Rossi. Editing and fact-checking by John and Dr. Zoe Vesley Gross. Our theme song is Sevens by Nathan Burke, performed by Nathan and John. Interrupting John theme and additional voices by Taylor Isaac Gray. You can reach John directly on Instagram and Facebook at Rossafari or by email at rossafaripod at gmail.com. Rossafari is part of the Daydreamer Media Network. Now, stop listening to me and go visit a zoo.